Welcome, neighbors, to the series we have named Talking with the Doctor. On the surface, it seems a simple thing. You visit the doctor, you tell him or her what's wrong, or what you think is wrong, or at least what is troubling you. He or she listens, nods, makes a few notes on the computer, asks a few questions, and proceeds to tell you what you need to know and what can or will be done to eliminate the problem. It sounds simple and routine, but it isn't. That first presentation of a health problem is very, very important, and there is never enough time for it these days. All too often, one or both participants in the conversation fail to make the best possible use of that too short time. That is what we hope to discuss and illustrate in this series of episodes, each of which features a health care issue or a major medical specialty. We'll talk about the problems of communication in each field. We invite you to join us. Dr. Paul Gross is uh, a former, that is to say, a retired academic. He was a uh, professor of biology at MIT and at the University of Rochester and the Taylor Professor of Biology at uh, the University of Virginia, where he was also the provost. Uh, and he was, for 10 years, the director of the MBL, the Marine Biological Laboratory, in Woods Hole. Gregory Acampora, MD, trained in anesthesiology at the University of Virginia and went on to Yale for advanced training and research. That research focused on echocardiography. He is a diplomat of the American Board of Anesthesiology. Dr. Acampora later became interested in substance abuse medicine and expanded his interests to mental health in general. Thus, after a fellowship in the neuroscience of alcoholism in 2008, he completed his training in psychiatry at the Boston University Medical Center in 2013. He is a diplomat of the American Board of Neurology and Psychiatry and recently joined the psychiatry faculty at the Massachusetts General Hospital. He's also an instructor at the Harvard Medical School. Nolara Lowe Steele, producer. Lowe is a professor at the Berkeley College of Music in Boston. She's a former opera singer, long associated with Sarah Caldwell's Opera Company of Boston, a successful music educator of long experience, and she is recognized as the impresario of excellent musical productions and a television performer as well. This episode in our series begins discussions with the medical specialists as opposed to the primary care physician. 
We're going to start today with Dr. Gregory Acampora, and we are very interested in knowing the background of a person who goes into your field, Dr. Campora. Thank you. Uh, it's a pleasure so to be here. So could you tell us what, welcome to our series, and tell us how you ever got to this place in life. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Never, the, no path in life is, is linear, but uh, right. I eventually chose psychiatry uh, for the same reason I think m most people who go into psychiatry do, and that is they really want to spend time getting to know people more. We have more time than most people do to spend with patients. Mm -hmm. But I want to be clear about something. Psychiatrists are medical doctors. Uh, they have gone to medical school, yes. completed medical school along with everyone else. And as they go into internship, they have to do medical rotations also. Uh, so I just want to make that very clear that you psychiatrists. You do the entire medical preparation. Correct. Which is what, eight years? Well, so ten? we finish four of college, mm -hmm. and then there are four years of medical school, yes. uh, which is for the general practice of medicine. Right. And then our specialty takes four years also uh, oh. from beginning to end. <laughs> yes. Oh my. That's right. It's a lot. It's a long time. So by the time you finish it. <laughs> well, you're, you're very well prepared. And, yes. and we, just like any other specialty, we take board exams. There are specialty exams for the field. Uh, there are national standards that have to be met. Right. And uh, they're rigorous, yes. and you have to be able to meet those. And so that's what our training is for, is to allow us to do that. Exactly. My, uh, Gregory, my field is training teachers. And what a lot of people don't understand is that they have to go through rigorous exams, state exams, in order to teach in the public schools. Therefore, you have to go through the state. Do you do a national exam or just a state exam? Yes, there's not a, just a state exam. <laughs> there's actually something called the Federation of Board Examiners, mm -hmm. and so not only is the do the psychiatrists make sure that the standards are met, but people from other disciplines in medicine are reviewing across fields to make sure that these things are at the level that people would like them to be across the board. Exactly. Paul, you were going to ask some questions. Well, actually, this last comment uh, leads into the question I was hoping to be able to ask. Um, your discipline, psychiatry, has been, if possible, even more subject to change in the last decade than most of the other specialties. Uh, I know what some of them are, but you know more than I do. Yes. The question is, how do you deal with that? You have a fixed body of practice and tradition, but the field is being changed all the time by new right. science. Yeah. So, Paul, the question you're touching on is that psychiatry historically has involved anal an analytical approach, and we all know about Sigmund Freud, and we know about the, the couch. The couch. Right. And sort of the analysis of the mind. Um, and to be sure, that's a cornerstone of psychiatry. However, the changes that you're talking about, Paul, are uh, the modernization of psychiatry, bringing it into the biology, yeah. the pharmacology, and the genetics. Neuroscience. The, the neuroscience that, yeah. that now is leading the charge in the field. So when you pick up a psychiatry journal now, rather than talking about childhood changes, we're talking about MRI imaging, areas of I the brain, noticed. activity in areas of the brain, mm -hmm. how medications are or are not affecting that. And so it really is a very dynamic and changing so, field. So, but it is a balancing act of taking, uh, making use of the old techniques Yes. And, and then moving uh, forward into modern the, medicine. The, the old tradition, which certainly has important values in it. It's critical. And uh, as you say, the, the slow change from the analytical model yep. to other models of practice. That's right. Must be difficult. 
Well, um, I, I think uh, I might be a little bit of a different case. I'm a little older, and so I actually had to shift some gears. But, you know, the young kids, if I can call them kids, <laughs> um, they, they are groomed into this, if you will. And so yes. um, they, they, they seem to be coming up to speed pretty well. Good. A little bit yeah. easier. Good. I wanted to talk with you, Gregory, about the fact that, that you had mentioned that in psychiatry, talk is the diagnostic tool as opposed to um, other things being R diagnostic tools in other fields of, of medicine. That's right. So imagine this, unlike another doctor who could use a stethoscope or use an x-ray yes. or draw labs and look MRI, at lab values. Cat well, we're, we are well, starting oh, to use MRI, oh, but, but, but on average, mm -hmm. the interface for us is talking and seeing the person, yes. and looking at their, their expressions, looking at their posture, and trying to piece together a story using those techniques. So I think the misnomer sometimes is when people say talk therapy or it's just talk. It's not like sitting down and having a cup of coffee. Right, exactly. And so what we become skilled at is during an interview in which we're trying to make the patient comfortable at the right. same time we have to gather yeah. some information right. now this brings to the point um, the psychiatrist may seem to be pushing along to be asking questions mm -hmm. and the patient may think oh but that's not what I'm here for and you have yeah. to realize that to do a, a proper diagnosis some of these questions must be answered so so that that needs to be remembered. Very important. And as you talked about, uh, not just the talk, but you are like theater directors. Theater directors must understand body language yes. and facial language as to what it will convey yes. on, on the stage or in movies. So you use that as diagnostic tool. That's right. And uh, people, we call it signaling, and people signal in more oh, ways yes. than they realize. Absolutely. Most of us uh, today, I'm wearing we a tie. All do it. Yeah. I, I combed my that hair and I, and I and I shave. Right. But these are all things we call signaling, and so psychiatrists are specialists at paying attention to signaling in many in many forms. Right. Uh, most people are not aware that they do this every day of the world. All of the time. Having to do, I used to say, um, uh, well, now let's see, who am I going to be today? And I will dress accordingly. Right. And okay. people tend to do that. They, As you say, the a certain can. tie for yeah. certain things. Everything we do says You can tell something. Gregory that she has a theatrical background. <laughs> yes. <laughs> oh, the full. I do have a theatrical background as well as educational. Excellent. But I'm always, the, the, the fields are not that far apart. Not at all. You it, know? It, it's, it, it is, it's, it's really, the part that is like the rest of medicine is observation. Observation yes. is a critical skill. Sure. Right. Yeah, that's the point. L let me let me take you to the, the I think maybe the the most worrisome thing about uh, a visit with a psychiatrist for the for our neighbors for for people who have reached adulthood who for whatever reason uh, they are um, referred to a psychiatrist either they or they, they either they themselves or with a with a sometimes with a caregiver who goes along with them. Uh, the most obvious thing that goes wrong when it first becomes, when the potential patient first becomes aware of it is memory loss. Uh, the first sign of what is immediately seen as a wider range of cognitive losses. I think most people become aware of that and uh, they worry about it terribly. And, and the visit with a psychiatrist simply escalates the concern. The concern, sure. What do you do about it? What do you do about it? Well, that's a great question, Paul. So the, think of, if you think of going to the psychiatrist like going to a doctor, it's, it's as simple as that. There's, yes. They are really just trying to help you to answer questions about something that you feel is changing or changed. 
And so if you can just frame it up as seeing a doctor that, again, rather than measuring your blood pressure or listening to your heart, is going to be paying attention to the way your mind is working, if you will. Scary. It's, it can be scary, but, but if you remember that many of the questions that are asked are asked in a sequence to measure. We're, we're, sure. We are, in fact, taking measurements, but not the way you think of. We, you don't think anything of the blood pressure cuff. That's right. So That's right. some of the questions that we ask are nothing more literally than, than taking a certain number of basic measurements. That, that's interesting. Now, I have found, Paul, when I do exams on older patients, we do do a memory test, and sometimes yeah. people get annoyed by things like naming the days of the week backwards or doing some mathematical things. But, but if you just frame that up as being nothing more than a set of measurements, that we can mark down and yeah. use yeah. as part of the objective feature. Or just say, feature. according to our theme, that's how they talk to you, by taking that test. That's right. They talk to the doctor by taking the memory test. That's part of it. That's a right. Yes, In fact, what we, just to help clarify, we usually divide our exam, our time with mm -hmm. a patient, into three segments. Yes. One is getting to know the person, being empathic, and just feeling like, you know, like, yeah. you're a person, I'm a person, let's right. talk. Then we'll tend to ask some psychiatric questions and then we'll do some memory testing. So, so in fact, uh, what just seems like a conversational encounter for us has a certain number of sequences and we are creating a, a, a body of information yes. to work from. I have a question about talking to, uh, to the psychiatrist. When in these situations that Paul brought up, when you have people of our age who are coming in with memory loss, mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> often these people have spouses or children mm -hmm. who will go to the session with the patient. Do you talk with both of them or do you try just to talk to the patient? Well, when it comes so so um, when it comes to doing a memory assessment, we always are talking to o other family members. So oh. we and what we do is we, in essence, are comparing the version that the patient says is happening exactly and with and what family might be with the effect that is happening with the family yes and sometimes the family may notice some patterns that are uh, very helpful does this happen when both people are both the patient so, are present so usually the t you initially spend time just with the patient okay. and then you get what we call later ancillary information mm -hmm. now it, i'm to be sure, and I'm just going to speak to you directly when I say this, it's not to compare and, and prove you that you made a mistake or that something was wrong. It's just a way of gathering information so that, so that it's a combined story. Uh, it's not to, make, to see if you were right or wrong. So, so it's important. additive information. It's, yes. it's not, no one's against you mm -hmm. or, or trying to yeah. get something that you may not have uh, said or, or said improperly. It's, sure. it's, it's really a collaborative effort. Do, the, do, do you find that this effort at mitigating the, the anxiety works? <laughs> <laughs> we try, we try. Okay, I mean, yeah. I can see why so, it was the trouble. So uh, if you will, as specialists of behavior, then we will pay attention to the person's response. If I'm seeing someone getting more anxious, or, or sure. withdrawing more, then I have to s pay attention to what I've done and try and make them more comfortable. Which leads us into doctor-patient relationship. And this is, um, in the old days, they talked about transference and counter-transference, and, and of course it happens out in daily life. Everybody transfers <laughs> and Not has counter-transference. Not me, never. <laughs> they just don't know that they're doing it. Yeah. But um, the relationship between the doctor and the patient must be very special, I think, in this S field. Yes, and um, I think the best thing to speak to the days of the old analysis where you would go in once a week or even daily yes. are, are far and few between. 
I was going to bring that up, yes. So, so in the old days, the couch was a daily thing. Oh, in gee. Freud's time, they, right. every day, in fact, he took some patients on vacation with him, so none of, there would be no break in the, in the exactly. daily routine. Exactly, and patients would panic if the doctor went was on it? vacation. Yes, right. yes. Yeah. So, whereas the encounters of today are more likely to be just like the visit to any other doctor. Interesting. The key thing to remember, again, is uh, to the patient is just be yourself when you're speaking to the psychiatrist he will be learning from you and the more you are yourself the more he will gather that will be helpful exactly so you could bring up you could be very direct so another common one in addition to, to memory problems is depression Indeed. And, and so you yeah. could simply say I feel depressed and then the doctor would say, Very simply. That's right. And then the doctor would s probably say, can you tell me a little bit more about that? And sure. that's what he means. He's just, he wants to hear your own words of what you're experiencing, not, yes. not to say it the way he wants to hear it, so that he can actually know what you, you, the individual, feels. And so, so the questions that we ask tend to be very broad and open for a purpose. Uh huh. It's because mm -hmm. we're trying to find out the most we can about you, that individual. In order to help yeah. you, the, the individual. So the old days of the, so, so this, so I think sometimes people think, ah, he's asking me this question so he can corner me. That's not what's happening. Well, I, I know. I know. It can feel very intimidating. And we can't that, read minds. Yeah, that, but that is exactly what we're trying to say to people. Right through this program. Right. And uh, I think it's intimidating also to see a surgeon or to see Absolutely. whatever, but somehow or other this is just so deeply it personal. Is. Of it course is. it is. You and, know, and, you've, and just, no you've just given me the explanation for something I never understood. Years ago, somebody invented a psychiatrist program to operate on an, uh, MIT's largest computer. And it became insanely popular. You probably know about I'm it. I'm not familiar with it. OK. It was a good program. But uh, all sorts of people would surreptitiously go down to uh -huh, the, to, to the <laughs> artificial intelligence lab to talk to that computer. And the, the trick that was used in it was the computer accepted every statement but followed it whenever possible with a, an encourager saying, Tell me a little more about that. <laughs> <laughs> and everybody loved it, and yeah. people opened up for that. Yeah. Yeah. But was the computer empathic? That's yeah. what I want to know. Well, that it was faking empathy, empathy. by faking. doing yes. that. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. But Showing I interest. It seems to me, Gregory, that that is one of the biggest prerequisites for someone in the field. Yeah, I, I without, I was, previously not a psychiatrist. I used to practice anesthesia and I used to work in the emergency room. Right. So I've been on the other side of the scale. Yes. I will tell you that now joining psychiatrists, they are, they are keenly interested in their patients, keenly yes. interested. They really want to be involved and they really want to spend time. And it is the unique feature of our field is that in these days where the visits are getting shorter and shorter yes. and shorter, we really do have the last need, bastion of being able to spend to have that a little closeness. time with you. Yes, that's right. Right, right. Uh, the whole area going into such things as neurobiology and Paul, I'm stepping on your toes here. Don't you dare. Chemistry mm -hmm. and so forth. That adds to the knowledge that you have to have. Well, I think yes, exactly. And uh, the other thing is, it's taking away some of the myth. Uh, of psychiatry. Yes. That, um, so we, what we're doing is we're backing up uh, some of the older observations were dead on, uh, but now we are actually showing that there's scientific basis behind some oh, of the things that we're seeing. Oh, that's interesting. So, yes. so it's, it is, it's, it's, it's nice. A We've got and both. It's balances kind of thing. Well, yes, yes. it is actually. Well, yes. you're, you're, it sounds, it looks to an outsider like you're, tr you, that your profession has finally given in to the reality of biology. 
Well, I, I don't, so I don't, rather than giving in, they're not mutually exclusive. And of in course fact, not. I think they, I think not. they blend in very yeah. nicely. In addition sure. to, or either, either is an addition yeah. to But in fact, other. there was, there was for a long time. Uh, well, yes. and I think Separation. that, I think as we are moving more into medical management, now, where we're giving more pharmacology, I think now uh, it, it, there is an obligation to make sure that you have the biological side of this. Yes. Uh, but understood. Gregory, how does a, a young guy like you, God uh, bless you. deal with <laughs> the, this flood of biology? Yeah. Uh, I see it. You know, I flip the pages of, of science, not happily, of, but, yes. but every week there's something new and worrisome and yeah. more complex. It's something. like taking a sip of water out of a fire hydrant fall. And, yeah. and it is, it's difficult. You have to parse through, oftentimes people pick areas of specialty and focus in on that, but you still are obligated to be on top of things. And these days now, uh, when you're boarded in a specialty, you have to be retested every yeah. 10 years. So yeah. they, they, the heat is on to make sure that you keep on top of it all. But right, yeah. and you're a clinician, yeah. so yeah. I don't read many books. First and foremost, <laughs> <laughs> I don't I, read I, I, because I'm busy people. reading other things. Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah. Well, Gregory Acampora, thank you for it's being here. It's been a pleasure. It is most eye-opening to have talked with you about your field. Um, we're going to be talking more and more about the different specialties, and each one has its own particular way of talking to you, and that their needs are for you to talk to them. Yeah. This was especially good in this field that can be a bit intimidating uh, as we go along. We want to invite you to keep watching for our episodes with talking with the doctor. We're going to be seeing people in the specialties of anesthesiology, um, in the field of, um, of medicines, and in the field of surgery. Various things that you might be interested in knowing about, and it certainly will be helpful to you in knowing how to talk with your doctor. And so with that, we will close. Thank you.